Hello, welcome back to Ling 201, Introduction to Linguistics. I'm your professor, Brett C. Nelson. This is week five lecture. Today we'll be talking about phonology, and specifically syllables and features. The readings for today were sections two and three from chapter three of Contemporary Linguistic Analysis, our textbook. Announcements for this week. On Thursday, your second discussion post is due to the D2L forum. It's labeled and has the, the instructions and questions uh, posted with it. And then on Friday, I will be posting the second quiz for the phonology chapter of this course. And that'll be due the following Friday. Um, so you'll have seven days and a few hours additional to do that. Um, please um, do these things on time. Um, so we'll start again with a land acknowledgement. We're here learning in the area where the Bow and Elbow Rivers meet in southern Alberta, a place known in Blackfoot as Mokinstis, a name now used to refer to the entire city of Calgary. This land lies within the territory of Treaty 7, which was signed by this land's stewards, representatives of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsotinaw First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. Additionally, this land is home to speakers of Cree and Tunaha, and I'm sure plenty of other indigenous languages as well as members of Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I am a newcomer to this land. I come from Valancha, the land of many tongues at the mouth of the Mississippi. Uh, the Great River is, is the translation of that in Ojibwe. Uh, I strive to learn more about the land, its peoples, their languages, and their history every day. At the University of Calgary, I hope to contribute to and continue a journey of transformation and renewal in our ways of knowing, doing, connecting, and being all with the spirit of truth and reconciliation for continued share and enjoyment of this beautiful place. So the plan for today will be defining a syllable, what it is and what it's made up of. Then we'll discuss the implications of the syllable in um, two levels of phonology, the prosodic level and then the segmental level. And then we'll talk about the final level of phonological analysis, which is the feature level. So we'll introduce the phonological features and run through the set of phonological features in English um, and possibly some other features that are used in other languages. We'll see. Mm -hmm. So syllables. Um, so phonemes, we've talked about phones, we've talked about phonemes, but really they don't often appear on their own individually, right? Um, they appear in groups, and indeed there is a level of analysis that we group them. Um, so when these phonemes uh, surface to uh, are grouped together, surfaces allophones or these allophones group together, this is the syllable. So the syllable, um, as you might be familiar with it, is a highly perceptible phonological unit, and it is a fundamental unit of rhythm in English and many other languages. So when we talk about like the rhythm of song or the rhythm of poetry, a lot of it has to do with the, with the timing of syllables. Um, so syllables are made up of one to four, possibly even more um, segments grouped together into a pronounceable unit. And we call that unit the syllable. Um, so syllable shapes and sizes vary across languages. I already said they could have one, two, three, or four or more segments. And so we can categorize how those segments appear into different templates and these shapes of the syllable. Um, so the simplest syllable is made up of a single vowel. And so we just use that, that V symbol to represent that. And so a, a V syllable like, would be like the English word, uh. And that's made up with that schwa vowel. Um, there's plenty of other of, of just vowel syllables in English um, and many other languages. Again, it's, it's a very simple syllable and it's really the minimal syllable for most languages, including English. Um, some, however, do require a consonant before it. And so the next uh, simplest syllable would be the CV syllable. And so we have lots of English words that are made up with the, of those and lots of English words that are made up of just one CV syllable. And so like the English word verb do, 
um, that has a, a consonant, D, followed by a vowel. U, du. Sometimes a syllable can have a consonant just following the vowel. So that would be a vowel and then a consonant, so a V, C. And so uh, if we were to prefix du with un, we would be adding a syllable to the beginning of it. And that syllable would be a V, C syllable, V being schwa, the, the C being in. So we get un, un, du. Um, you can also have those kind of those shapes combined into a C V C syllable. So you have a consonant followed by a vowel followed by a consonant. Um, this happens in English, but I think we've talked enough about English. So for uh, another example, we can look to Mandarin. Um, we have the the the, the word pansu. Um and so that first syllable is P A N is how they spell it in in Pinyin. Um, but they also give it its whole, a, a whole character to spell that whole syllable. So we have pan, and so that means plate. Um, pan uh, in Spanish means bread, um, coincidentally. So um, with these so simple syllable shapes that make up a whole word, you can get lots of um, syllables that exist in many different languages with minor alterations to the actual pronunciation but they're similar enough that you might think pan is, is bread if you speak Spanish, or panza is plate if you speak uh, Mandarin. Or pan, if you speak English, is a pan, like you, you fry an egg in. So there's lots of those potentially punnable um, cross-linguistic cross homophones, which are fun for me, and maybe for you. Um, you could also chain consonants, obviously, or into clusters. We, we know that you could have more than one consonant uh, uh, next to each other, so the consonant-consonant sequence. And so we can have that like in the word, the French word, just again moving outside of English, we have a, a consonant-consonant vowel, so we have the syllable B-L-E, pronounced in French, ble, which means wheat. Um, alternatively, you could put two consonants after the vowel. And so you could have a vowel consonant consonant uh, syllable, like in the Kakchikel word ansh, which is actually, which is, means garlic and is um, an old loan word from Spanish, actually. I won't get, it, it's a bit complicated how, it, how we got from ajo to ansh, but trust me, it is a loan word because that's not a typical syllable shape. It's only a typical. Sh it's only a, a syllable shape in Kakchikel that arises from a complicated um, sequence of, of borrowing from Spanish. And uh, doubling up is not limited to consonants. You can, of course, double up vowels, and that's how we get kind of those um, diphthongs. So um, diphthongs in English are made up of that C V V sequence. So a V V sequence in the middle of a vowel is the diphthong. Um, you can also lengthen a vowel. So we, we talked in um, the, f the second phonetics week about uh, the, the, the long vowels. Um, those are technically sequences of two vowels. Um, they just happen to be the same vowel and within the same syllable. And so we get a, a syllable shape that has two vowels, C, C, and so that's C, V, V, C. So that's a consonant, a vowel, a vowel, a consonant. And so the example we gave for long vowels, it, we could give for long vowels is the long vowel in non. They write that when they transcribe it into a Latin alphabet with uh, two A's because it is a sequence of two A's that just make a long A. So you get non, non for that, um, uh, flatbread there we have a photo of I hope you're hungry too because I am always hungry so there will be lots of food in all of the slides you're welcome so those are the syllable shapes um, but obviously we have a set of segments or phonemes in a language um, but you can't just go and combine all of those um, different 
phonemes into together into any syllable you want there are actual rules in in how you can which which segments you can combine with other segments and so these rules are called phonotactics so phono meaning sound tactics meaning arrangement really so the arrangement of sounds within usually a syllable but it could also refer to how you arrange them in a word when you're building up to the word level so basically this is the rule of of your sound arrangements within um, larger units and so most languages only allow certain syllable templates so the, sh the shapes on the last slide um, some languages might only allow cv shapes or cvv or CVVCs. Um, they might not allow certain clusters. And all of that has to do with like kind of the ultimate level of phonotactics. Um, uh, but you can get minor levels of phonotactics by its restrictions on what, which consonants or which vowels can appear in certain shapes as well. And so, yeah, this is the this phonotactics is the further those further restrictions on which segments are going to appear where. Um, so, an, an example of phonotactics, so you can return to English, is with the s phoneme, the alveolar, um, fric the voiceless alveolar fricative. It can appear before p, t, and k, so it can appear before before stops, and so you can get a a word like skis or or spies and so those would consist of a c and a c and a v but you could also have a c c c v with s and a stop plus an additional segment and that the, 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 that additional segment is restricted to these four l r y and w so uh, those are the approximants in english um, and so S can appear before P, T, and K, plus an optional approximate. So it can appear before stops, plus an optional approximate. So you can get a word like screws, um, like these things. These are screws. And so that's a C, 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 V, C syllable. However, you can't get a, a word like snooze, even though that is a C, 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 V, C syllable, just like screws, um, because that third C isn't a... An approximate, um, it breaks the phonotactics of English, and so it's not a permissible syllable. So we don't have that as a syllable or a word in English. Um, a more complicated uh, phonotactic in English is the restriction on the diphthong ow. So ow um, can be followed by uh, a consonant, so it can appear in a VC or a CV, or I guess technically it's a VV, so CVV. C syllable. Um, however, and it could also even be longer than that in, in the after the vowel. So you could have a C V V C C syllable. However, um, what must immediately follow that ow uh, vowel is, are these uh, segments, these phonemes. And so t d s z n l r r sh j ch and j. And if you made those sounds with me, um, or you can, or you just remember back to the phonetic sections, you you can um, come up with a generalization for all of those sounds, and those are all um, alveolar or palatal sounds, or alveolar palatal sounds. So all of these, the, the first few, all the way up to here, are are definitely alveolar sounds, and then these are. Um, alveolar, palatal, or palatal sounds, the last four. And so ow can only be followed by uh, alveolar or alveolar palatal sounds. And so we can have a word like hound, which has that N and a D following that ow vowel, but you can't have a non-alveolar or alveolar palatal sound. So you can't have this velar nasal, hound. That's not a permissible sequence in English, it so it breaks the phonotactics, and so that's not a syllable or a word in English. So phonotactics is really our first step into building words from our segments, um, because it tells you which segments can combine with which other segments. And so if you're a native speaker of English, you can probably, you, you'd probably almost definitely agree um, with these uh, 
these these judgments uh, I've given in, them in red and I've at, uh, noted it, them with an asterisk and the asterisk means that they're not allowed in the language. And so native and near native um, fluent speakers of English would uh, know these phonotactics somewhat subconsciously. If you just know them, you don't have to really be taught them. They're just part of the rules of English that you know when you know English. Um, a fun note about this is that um, gibberish, or just speaking in in syllables that aren't that don't really make up words, um, people have done studies on this, and they found that gibberish often follows the phonotactic rules of a speaker's language. It just happens that the syllables they make don't make up actual words; they're just permissible syllables. And so, when you're speaking in gibberish, often um, your subconscious phonotactics restrict which syllables you can make, um, even though you're not trying to make anything meaningful. Um, so you would make a, a syllable that was, has the ow vowel followed by an alveolar sound, uh, and you won't make a gibberish syllable that has the ow sound followed by a bilabial sound. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of a fun thing about non-language speech. Um, that even that follows rules, and when we're trying to break the rules of meaning, um, the, meaning the, the rules of sound still apply, which is awesome, fascinating. I, I found that all amazing, and there's, there's videos on it, um, like Simlish um, follows, if not the rules of English, oh, the rules of like Swedish, the phonotactic rules, I think, because that's where they make the sims, I might be wrong. Um, but um, so Simlish um, might sound somewhat Swedish to your English ears because it, it's made up of syllables that are either English or Swedish. I'll have to check. There's definitely videos uh, elsewhere on YouTube. But that's, again, fascinating to me. So I'd love to talk about it. Um, so phonotactics are often a barrier in phonological acquisition. So when you're trying to learn a new language, um, you have to learn, and those the, the new languages phonotactics break the rules of uh, your, your, your first language's phonotactics, then uh, you, ha you have to learn to break the rules of your original language in order to speak the um, target language um, fluently. So for the for that's, again, a first step in learning a new language is learning that language's phonotactics. Um, it's not all, it's not necessary to um, really get uh, a full acquisition or a, a a relatively full acquisition of the language. Um, so some languages don't permit an initial s before a stop, and so they'll add a vowel before that s or a vowel after that s. Um, so an example is uh, Spanish, um, which doesn't allow um, S before stops at the beginning of syllables. And so you might hear someone whose native language is Spanish speaking English and say a student or a school. Um, but it helps that the words for those in Spanish is estudiante or escuela, but because they're really the same root, they're the same Latin root, but um, Spanish uh, has changed its phonotactics from Latin and, and it does, so now it doesn't permit that initial S consonant cluster. And it avoids that by putting the S with uh, another vowel. And so we're, we're going to be talking about um, how the, the sequences of sounds are actually arranged uh, in the upcoming slides. Um, so, uh, but first we'll have to formalize the phonotactic rules of a language. And so um, we have to make reference to various parts of the syllable. So for the next few slides, we're going to be talking about those parts in the syllable structure. So syllables, which we'll be using this, this sigma symbol, lowercase sigma, it's a Greek that just means S, S for syllable. Um, we just couldn't use English or, or Latin letters, so we, we use Greek instead. Um, but syllables are made up of different slots or positions. So now we're, we, we have these, we, we, we've been talking about this, this high level of the syllable. Now we're going to be getting into the parts of the syllable below it. So 
the first part we'll be talking about is, is uh, the first part of the syllable, and that's called the onset. And so this is everything before the core of the syllable, and we'll define what the core is. Um, but we're just going in, in, in chronological order for now. So onset is everything at the beginning of a syllable, and it's typically one or more consonants. So that S could be a, an onset. In English, an S and a stop can be an onset, or an S, a stop, and an approximate could be an onset. And so everything before the core is the onset, and they're typically just it. So it's just consonants before the core. Um, and the core is part of what we would call the rhyme. So the rhyme is the core and everything that comes after it. And so the core is what I've referred to several times already in the slide is the nucleus. The nucleus is usually a vowel, um, but it can also be a syllabic consonant. So in one of the first lectures of this lecture series in this course, we talked about syllabic consonants. Uh, we had a discussion section if you came to that. Um, and what a syllabic consonant is, is what occurs when there is no vowel available for the nucleus. So a consonant takes over the nucleus role, the core of the syllable. And then you just have a CCC syllable, or just minimally a C syllable. Um, but that's not the end of the syllable. There, there can be things after it, like we said, with um, the restrictions on what can follow the, the owl vowel in English. Um, things can, uh, in order th for things to follow it, there needs to be a position for them to take. And that position is called the coda position. And that is everything after the nucleus. And we'll refer to that with, for some reason, once we get below the syllable level, we're okay with using Latin letters. So we have O for onset, R for rhyme, N for nucleus, and C for coda. And once again, uh, the nucleus is the core of the syllable, and the coda is everything after that. And so the nucleus and the coda come together to form the rhyme, and the onset and the rhyme come together to form the whole syllable. Um, so consonants um, are typically make up the coda. So yeah, codas are always made up of consonants. Um, nucleus are usually made up of vowels, but can be um, a syllabic consonant and onsets are typically one or more consonants as well. So that's how we're going to be organizing consonants and vowels into our syllables. Consonants go to the onset, um, vowels go to the rhyme. You can have a consonant in the rhyme. And then other everything after that, are, all the consonants after that are part of the coda. So for an example, we have a syllable in, of the word bread, um, bread, um, is a C, if we just count what we see in the transcription here, we have a C, a C, a vowel, a long vowel, is, as we mentioned, it can be transcribed with two vowels. So we have a C, V, or a C, C, V, V, C syllable. And so now we can uh, diagram that with our trees. And so we would just um, break that into the rhyme and the onset. And so the rhyme, as I mentioned, is that vowel followed by the everything after it, and the onset is everything before that vowel. And so the onset is B and R, br, and then the rhyme is ed. You can, again, the, the lengthening is because this is a voiced obstruent. Um, it, at, at the phonetic level, however, it is just a, a, short con a short vowel, so we can transcribe it that way at the phonemic level. Um, so here uh, um, I've, I've reappeared uh, that long vowel, and so uh, the nucleus is that long vowel e, eh, whereas the, the coda of that rhyme would be the d, the d. And so the nucleus is e, eh, the coda is d, the onset is br. And so we could put this in our diagram like this, um, and so we have the onset b and r, and then the nucleus e, and then the coda d. So that is your syllable tree for the syllable and word bread. Um, but this is going to be definitely on the assignment and something uh, 
that will be very helpful to, in order to break down words and syllables into their structure. So again, uh, I've give, I will give you a step-by-step -step process uh, to building a syllable structure tree. And so the first step would be to write out all of the segments that you're going to be putting on your tree. Then you'll find the nuclei, or, the, or if there's just one, it's a nucleus. If there's more than one, there's, it's a nu there, there are multiple nuclei. So you identify those vowels or the syllabic consonants, which will serve as your nuclei. And then you portion off the onsets, which is everything before each of the um, nuclei. And it's the longest permissible strings of the consonants. So that refers to the phonotactics of the language. And so that can be three segments in English. Um, it could be shorter or longer, depending on the language. Um, um, but yeah, so when you're building the syllable structure, you want to always put the longest possible string of, of, of consonants in the onset, and then uh, and that'll be to the left of each nucleus you build that onset. And then once you're done with the onsets, then you can associate the codas to the segments which are left unassociated to the right of each nucleus. And then step five is to actually connect the tree together. So you connect the nucleus and the coda to the rhyme, and then the onset and the rhyme to the syllable. And then I think we will yeah, we'll have an example here. So our example is the two-syllable word building, building. If we could break that down, building, building, yeah, building. And so first we would transcribe that into our IPA. So we write out the segment, step one building. Then we find the nuclei. So the nuclei are the two vowel symbols, i and i. And so we, we put that, uh, we identify that so we can start to portion off the onsets and the codas. And so the onsets are the longest permissible strings to the left of each nucleus. So that's easy for the, uh, the first syllable, the first nucleus. There's only one, so there's only one consonant to the left. And so that's our onset for that uh, nucleus. Uh, so b, b, is b is the onset for building. However, l d is not a permissible string. It's not a permissible onset in English. So we only associate that d to the onset of the second syllable. And what that leaves us with are u and ng. And those are our codas for each of their vowels, each of their nuclei which we connect to the coda level. And then step five is just to connect everything up to that uh, syllable symbol, the sigma. And then so the rhyme is made up the, of each of that nucleus and the coda. So the first rhyme is ill, the second rhyme is ing. And then the onset for the first syllable is b, the onset for the second syllable is d. And so we get our two syllables, bill and ding, to make up the, two, the syllable structure of building. And so you've grown a tree. Congratulations. Um, so that step-by-step -step process should get you pretty much all of the syllable structure of English, if you know English, and any language, if you know that language. So, um, but you have to know what the permissible strings are, are, are in that of consonants in order to build the onsets, right? Um, so the, again, that has to do with the kind of innate knowledge of the language, which is why I only ask you to build syllable structures for English or possibly French in this course. So as I said, yeah, permissible strings. Often languages have basic requirements for their syllables. Um, and the strings have to do with something we'll call a sonority requirement. And sonority is basically the soundiness, that's, base, that's what that means, soundiness, um, how um, resonant um, each sound is. So uh, um, we'll define what that means in a bit, but to, uh, to make the simple, sonority rises before the nucleus and falls after it. So the nucleus is, that's why it's the core, it is it's the most sonorous part of uh, its syllable. So what is sonoria? Sonority is how open or vibrant, or as I said, um, soundy, a sound is. Um, and there is a kind of four level um, scheme 
uh, or spectrum for sonority. And it's drawn out here. So an obstruent has zero sonority. So an obstruent is a stop or a fricative or an affricate because they close the mouth. So they're, they're, they're not open at all. A nasal is a, one step above that um, because there is the closure in the mouth, but there's an opening in, in the nasal cavity. So it is a bit more open than an obstruent. Then you have liquids, which don't have a complete closure of in the mouth. And then getting closer to the vowel, we have the semivowels or glides, which is a, a sonority of three. And then you have the vowel with the highest sonority, which we'll call a sonority of four. So obstruent zero, nasal one, liquids two, glides three, and vowels four. So glides are always going to want to appear right before or right after vowels, liquids um, before glides, um, nasals before that, in English, I don't think we allow nasals before liquids. No, no. usually not. Um, but in this spectrum, uh, they, they, they fall at a level between obstruents and liquids. So um, that'll be useful in determining the, the, the permissible strings before and after um, the, the nucleus. So if the nucleus is the vowel, we want to build up starting with a zero obstruent, a zero sonority obstruent, build up towards that four, glide, uh, four vowel, four sonority vowel, and then after that you could fall back down to a zero, or approach to a zero. Um, so yeah, obstruents are the segments which block that airflow, the stops, the fricatives, and affricates. They should be the furthest from the nucleus, and then as you get closer to that nucleus, you get more and more sonorous sounds. So you get liquids, glides, and then vowels. Vowels are the most sonorant, therefore they're the perfect nucleus. But you do get other sounds which can be um, their nucleus, and those are typically your liquids and nasals. Obstruents typically aren't syllabic. Um, so if we were to label the sonority for an example syllable or word, like the English word grain, well, first you'd have to transcribe it because, um, well, leaving it like that, is, you, you, can, you can still transcribe uh, based on, on the orthography of English, but for this course's sake, we're going to try to transcribe as much as we can. So that's the transcription for grain. We have g, r, a, the diphthong, and then n. And so if we were to label the sonority of each of these segments, we have zero for the g, because that's an obstruent, it's a stop. Then we have r, which is a liquid, and so that has a sonority of two. And then we have the diphthong a, so each of those uh, as we transcribe it, uh, the y is actually a glide. And so once we have that a uh, vowel, then we have to start going back down the sonority sequence, the sonority uh, spectrum. So then we can have that glide, like I said, the glide y follow is, it, it likes to be next to the vowel. And then we fall back down to a one for the nasal, n. So we start with zero, go up through two, four, then down three, one. And so it goes up and down. That's, that's how syllables work. You basically start with, no, start with low, sonorant, low, low sonorant, low sonority, that's the word, and then move up to the high sonority vowels and then back down, then back up to the next vowel, then back down, then back up, and go on and go on. And that's how we, we, we um, produce sequences of syllables is we have these sequences of uh, rising and falling of the sonority scale. Um, but yeah, this syllable meets the sonority requirement and thus it's a permissible syllable um, in, in English and many languages. Um, you could have G followed by an R, followed by an A, followed by a Y, followed by a N. Um, because obstruents are very low so sonority, they typically lead off consonant clusters um, because uh, consonant clusters are sequences of multiple consonants, the second consonant um, in the cluster will be either an obstruent, a nasal, a liquid, or a glide. Um, at the after it, in the, in the coda position, it'll be the reverse. Um, so the, the thing closest to the vowel would be a glide, and then a, a liquid, then a nasal, then an obstruent. Um, so yeah, it kind of mirrors itself in, or, in order to match that rising and falling of the sonority. 
so yeah, that's the sonority requirement. But there's another requirement in um, building uh, strings of, of segments into the syllable structure, and that's the binarity requirement. And this binary means two, so this refers to the fact that each slot of the syllable is at most binary. It can only branch into two. And for this reason, you often only get two consonants in, in onset position and two consonants in coda position and two uh, vowels in uh, nucleus position. Uh, and this is the rule for most languages, uh, many languages, of, yeah, pretty much most languages, is, is they have a maximum a binarity requirement, a maximum of two segments, and each of the onset and the coda. And really, if you think about it, the nucleus can only have two segments, whether it's a, 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 a long vowel or a diphthong with uh, two different um, vowel um, qualities. Or, as we saw with this example, we, in, in the tree we have a branching onset with the G and the R, and a branching coda with the Y and the N, that glide followed by the nasal. So this syllable also meets the binarity requirements. Um, the onset only branches into two, the rhyme only branches into two, and the coda only branches into two. The syllable also only branches into two before it, the rhyme br branches into the nucleus and the coda. So each of the levels of the syllable structure tree is binary, and that um, fits the binarity requirement for um, uh, the, the strings that make up a syllable. But what about, uh, we mentioned that S can precede a C and an R, a C and an L, a consonant, when I say C. So we have a word like stretch. What is that doing? Uh, well, let's stretch it out and see. So this is a bit, this is what we're going to call a complex or an exceptional syllable because it does break that binary requirement, right? or it seems to. Some syllables have those extra segments that you have to put somewhere. Um, well, um, if we were to draw the tree out for stretch, we would have that binary onset for T and R, but what about that S at the beginning before it? Um, everything else is fine, but this seems to be quite exceptional um, in terms of our structure. Well, um, connecting S to the onset would break binarity, because you can't have a, a, a three-way branch of onset. Um, furthermore, it breaks um, sonority because you're not rising between S and T. S is an obstruent and T is an obstruent. Um, so you're going from zero to zero. It's not um, rising as you're going from consonant to consonant. So it seems to be breaking the sonority rule as well. Because before the nucleus, you have to be rise, always rising between each of the uh, consonants of an onset. So what do we do with this? It just seems to be all around breaking the rules. And yeah, it, it's what it is, it's breaking the rules. So we have to give it an exceptional status. And so what we do is we just attach it straight to the syllable level in what we call an appendix, because it just kind of appends itself there. Um, so these appendix or appendices are segments that are written or that are within a syllable, but outside of other slots, such as the onset, nucleus, or coda. And so what we have to say is that the binarity and sonority rules or requirements only apply to the onset and coda. And so whenever things we have to break those rules, we'd rather break them with uh, where they don't apply at the syllable level. So S attaches right to the syllable level and you get a three-way branch of the syllable with the appendix, the onset, and then the rhyme. You could also do that at the... Um, at the other side, with the coda level, you just attach, say, an S or a Z right up, right up to the syllable, um, the syllable sound. So you could say stretch, or I wouldn't be stretches um, because of reasons, but you have a word like kites. Yeah, kites. You have, in the coda of that word, you have T and then S, um, but T isn't falling. It's because codas have to be falling in their sonority. Um, so that S would actually be an appendix to the syllable after the coda. So you have K in onset, I in, or A in the nucleus, then Y in the coda, 
and then t in the coda, so you have the branching binary coda, and then s would uh, come in and attach right to the syllable. So we've talked for 40 minutes maybe about syllables. What are they good for? Stress. They're very stressful. Now, um, in many languages, stress is assigned to whole syllables. And this indicates uh, when we talk about st a stressed syllable, it means they have increased acoustic prominence. Uh, and in English, oftentimes, stress placement, so where you place the stress within a multisyllabic word, a, syllable, a, a word with multiple syllables, uh, is very sensitive to the weights of each of those syllables. Um, so syllable weight refers to the composition of the rhyme. Um, so we can have light syllables, which are made up of just the nucleus in the rhyme. So we just have the, the simple syllable do, and so you have d in onset, and then the, the rhyme would actually be, just be a nucleus, and that nucleus would be u. And so that would be a simple light syllable, but you could also have a heavy syllable. And so a heavy syllable refers to a nucleus plus a coda. And so it refers to that branching coda, or branching rhyme, rather. Um, so any syllable that has a coda is a heavy syllable. And so for an example, um, that we might look like it's spelled the same. Yeah, it is spelled the same in English with uh, done and do. Um, it looks like do followed by something else. And, and that something else makes those syllables heavy. So un would be the rhyme of done. And so that un would make done a heavy syllable. And o being a diphthong with that off glide, we call it the wa following that o, o is also a heavy syllable because it has a coda as well. And so usually, or many times, English will place the stress on uh, the heavy syllable. But there are uh, there is a bit of a nuance with that, in that for verbs, um, English likes to put, put stress on the final syllable if it's heavy. But if it's light, if it, it's the second last, or the penultimate, as they call it, um, when we're assigning stress, because we just really don't like using English words. So it's this penultimate means second to last, or second last. Um, so if if the last syllable is light, then uh, stress is on the um, second last or penultimate syllable. So a word like study, where the alt, the last the final syllable is light e d, um, because there's no coda to that, it's just a d simple syllable. Then we have a, a final light syllable, so we would assign stress to the penultimate syllable. So we it's study, it's not study. And that's what we call penultimate stress, and verbs would do that with a final light syllable. But if we were to have a, 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 a heavy syllable at the end of a verb, like support, um, we have a coda. We have two um, coda consonants. And, and so that makes it not only a heavy syllable, but a, a super heavy syllable. And that uh, would attract the stress, um, because our rule for verb stress if, is for vi final syllables are so if the final syllable is heavy, then the stress falls on that syllable. So that's why we get the stress on support rather than support. And that's a pretty general rule in English. Um, the stress goes on the final syllable if it's heavy and the second to last syllable if that syllable is not heavy. What about a word like puncture? Well, if we were to draw out, if we were to transcribe that, um, we would have a light final syllable because that final syllable is actually a syllabic consonant. And so there's nothing in coda. The nucleus is just that r, puncture, chur, chur. There's no vowel there. It's just r. And because there's no, there's no vowel there, that r moves into the nucleus position. There's no coda. And that makes it a light syllable. And therefore, we get Punk penultimate stress on the on the punk rather than on the chur. So we have puncture. And that stress would give you the aspiration on punk as well. So yeah. Um, those are our verb stress rules for um, that have that make reference to the syllabic level. Um, this contrasts with noun stress rules where we just have usually um, there's there's more than there's more cases than this. 
But for most cases uh, in English, nouns usually stress the, the penultimate or second last syllable without re refer reference to the weight of either of the syllables. So that's one way verbs and nouns differ in how they assign stress. Um, phonology, other, other parts of phonology besides stress can also make reference to the syllable. And so this is syllable-based phonology. Uh, many of our phonological processes depend on which segments are, are appearing where in the syllable, and we call the, that process the syllabification of the, of the syllables. And so, Eng as I said, English aspiration uh, makes reference to um, the syllabification of the word. So voiceless stop, we, we've, we said that voiceless stops aspirate at the beginning of words, but it's, it's actually more specific than that. Um, so we have a word like cool. I don't, again, that K is there. I need to remove that K. So that word is cool. But we could also have a word prove. Prove. Um, so both of those stops at the beginning of the words are, uh, are uh, aspirated because they're at the beginning of the words. But technically, they're also at the beginning of a syllable. So aspiration occurs syllable initially, um, but more specific than that, as I mentioned on the last slide, is that uh, stop, voiceless stops aspirate at, in the onset of stressed syllables. Um, when the syllable is unstressed, they typically are unaspirated. So a word like akin, uh, where we have stress on that final syllable, kin, akin, we get aspiration, but in a word like aching, 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 there's less or even no aspiration. There's no puff of air with that K that's spelled with a CH for some reason. Um, because the, the stress is actually on the first um, syllable, A, and then king is unstressed. So aching um, is the is the, the syllabification of that, and so we get an unaspirated K. Um, Another reference to uh, the syllable is in vowel length. Um, so as we said, vow vowels lengthen before voice sounds, but that's not, again, it's not the whole story. It's more specific than that. So used, um, we get a lengthened oo there. And then with cube, we also get a length there. Um, so what is happening is actually uh, a reference to whether the coda has a voiced obstruent. So whether that coda is made up of a, a voice stop fricative or affricate. And if it is, then you lengthen the vowel before it. Um, if that if the following consonant is actually in the onset of the following syllable, then you don't lengthen. Uh, so we could see that with uh, the pair prove, prove, we have the rhyme of that being oov, oo followed by a voiced fricative, and that so that's an obstruent, so you would voice or lengthen the vowel. But if you were to have a word like disproven, disproven, um, you would, uh, if you were to draw the syllable structure for that, you'd see that the v is actually the onset of the following uh, syllabic nasal. And because of that, it's an onset. It's not in the coda of prove. It's not in the coda of the uval. And so you don't get a lengthening of that uh, of that uval. You, you just get the stress assigned because that's where it goes. And so you get disproven, disproven. And so there isn't actual lengthening before the obstruent. You just get maybe lengthening because of stress. So that's the rule in English, is that before uh, uh, vowels lengthen before voiced obstruents in the coda of that syllable. If, it does, if, if the following consonant is an onset, then you don't lengthen. So that is a phonological process that makes reference to the syllable and the syllable structure as well. Um, and to use a, an example from a language other than English, um, a language that I happen to study, um, Kakchikel, the Mayan language. Um, uh, a rule is for sonorants, which are, are the class of liquids and glides. 
in that language, um, they become fricatives in coda positions. So anytime uh, you have to syllabify and you get a, a sonorant in a position, a coda position following a nucleus, um, instead of being sonorants, they are actually obstruents. So that's just a process that turns sonorants into obstruents in coda position, which is fascinating. So here is an example of that. Um, we have on the left, carinel, carinel. So uh, we're, lo we're looking at that R sound, R. It's a, a tap or, or sometimes a trill, carinel. Um, it means fissure, but really that inel uh, suffix is what make, is making the fissure from fish. And so kar, karsh is what actually means fish, the K-A-R. And when you don't have anything following that R, uh, it can't be an onset, it has to be in coda. So it's a coda to a nucleus uh. And when that happens, it becomes a fricative. So we get that sh sound, kush, instead of kar, kar, instead of kar. <laughs> it's really hard because it's, a, it's an automatic process in Kakshikel that turns sonorant sounds like that r sound or the r sound and turns them into obstruent or fricatives usually. So we get kush from karinel, or depending on your where, what you, where you start from, karinel from karsh. So yeah, there's lots of different phonological processes that make reference to the syllable. Another example is with w. W is a, a semivowel or a glide. Um, so you could have a word like nite wush, wah, wah, nite wush. In onset, it's a wah. But if, it, if it's in coda, by removing um, all the other um, pieces of the word, you just get the root, uh, which means cold, which is spelled T-E-W. But because that W is in a coda position, it's immediately following a nucleus or a vowel, and not followed by anything else, then you get a tef, tef. So wa becomes f in coda position, just like r becomes sh in uh, coda position. So sonorants become fricatives in coda in Kakchikel, but only um, Kakchikel, not English. Maybe some other languages as well. Um, definitely some other languages um, that are related to Kakchikel, but not English. In English, um, sonorants are okay to be in coda position. Uh, but basically, that's just a bunch of examples to say that syllabification matters. And so we will be practicing building trees uh, for the next couple of weeks. And really the rest of the course is going to be devoted to building trees of various types. And so yeah, we'll, be, we'll be definitely be practicing building our trees together. And if you want, on your own. So that's the first part of today's lecture. Um, that's really section, I guess, two. Yeah, we're doing sections two and three. Um, the next section is a bit different because it's a whole different level of phonological analysis, and that is features. So we've looked a lot at segments, and we looked at syllables, but um, segments, um, they, they seem to be related to each other, and we can draw that relation at a level below the segment, so different parts of the segment that, are, that can be related to other segments. Um, and so some segments are more similar to each other than to others. And so how do we kind of formulize or formulate that, that relationship? We need to make reference to those individual parts that can be similar or dissimilar to other segments. And that is going to be this, this new level of analysis, the featural level. Um, so features are the building blocks to our building blocks. Um, I mentioned last week um, we have kind of our atoms but even atoms, which are the building blocks of the universe, have parts within them. You either the level of uh, the protons and neutrons and electrons, or even below that, the quarks, um, the segments, or the, the yeah, the sounds that we've been looking at, the hand shapes, uh, uh, have a a level of analysis below them, and these are the features, the building blocks of those segments. So each feature refers to, and, and when we're talking about sounds, refers to some articulatory aspect of that segment. 
And so this will make a lot of reference to the phonetics. So we call these phonetically grounded. So that you just like you stick a post in the phonetics and that reaches out to the phonology so that we could talk about it in phonology. That's why we call it grounded. Um, and so we'll use these features to actually codify um, and formulate the contrast of a language into sets of distinctive features. Um, so these features are phonetically grounded, but they, they make uh, differences in the, the phonology or the phonemes, so they're phonemically relevant. To, these phonetically grounded features are phonemically relevant. Um, so we've kind of already been doing this. We've been discussing how we can group features to get, or segments together based on their similarities. Like we talked about all of the alveolar sounds or the alveolar palatal sounds or the voiced sounds or the obstruents. These are all different levels of natural classes that are referring to these features. Um, so natural classes are these groups of similar segments based on shared features. So we have the voiced natural class, which is in English, these are the, vo uh, the voice consonants. If we had all of the voice sounds, we also include the vowels. But um, these are the voiced, um, the voice obstruents specifically. Ba, da, ga, va, da, za, ja, ja. Those are your voiced obstruents in English. Then you could have the voiceless obstruents. Pa, ta, ka, fa, tha, sa, sha, and cha. Um, you could also just refer to the stops within the obstruent class. You have stops, fricatives, and affricates. So the stops are pa, ta, ka, ba, da, and ga, where the fricatives are fa, tha, sa, sha, fa, the, za, ja. I also forgot H, so I'll add that in after this presentation, but H is also a fricative in English. Um, another natural class is, is the one that makes reference to that makes reference to the manner of articulation it are the nasals. So you have the three nasal consonants in English, ma, na, and nga, that velar nasal. Um, so natural classes, um, these are just the manner natural classes. They can be more or less specific or refer to something completely different as well. So we could have the voiced stops. And so that would just be a subset of the voiced and the stop um, natural classes, the shared ones. So the ba, da, ga, and so we get that with the voice stops, the ba, da, and ga. Um, the consonants are, this is um, all of the obstruents plus all of the liquids plus all of the nasals. And I, am I ne neglecting H again? I'm so bad. Um, so H will be in here as well. Um, so pateka, badaga, fathasa, shavada, zhzha, cha, ja. Mana, na, la, ra, uh, and h are consonants. Um, so that refers to a consonantal feature. So the, the, the specificity, the specific specificity of the natural class depends on which and how many features the natural class refers to, and that'll capture more or fewer um, sounds or segments, phonemes. Um, so you know, what we find uh, when we start to group all of these natural classes that is that they actually pattern together in the phon phonology and really in the phonotactics, as we saw with ow only being uh, allowed to be followed by um, the alveolars and palatal alveolars. So members of the same natural class pattern together in phonology. And so that's how we know there is something that's binding them together. And that is our, it's going to be what we call our features, our distinctive features. Um, so this follows half century or more of, of, of comparison and analysis work in, in phonology. Um, but this feature set that we use in English goes back to 1968. So again, half century into a work called The Sound Pattern of English uh, by Chomsky, Noam Chomsky and Morris Holly. And so this redefined uh, what was previously just looking at segments on their own and just making analysis based on that and starting to group them together based on these features, the sound patterns of English. So this, this work outlined the distinctive features of English so that we could refer to the features rather than individual segments on their own. And so this SPE, as we're going to call it, uh, sound pattern of English, uh, set out several categories of features. Um, and many of these categories have a binary notation. 
And so it's either going to be present with a plus and then not present, if it's not present, with a negative. Uh, and we'll see how that looks in a bit. Um, but our first uh, uh, set of features, or category of features, is the major class. And this defines the sound class, which we introduced, really, the first major lecture of this course was what this, the sound classes of uh, spoken sounds. And so that's going to be your consonants, plus or minus consonantal. Uh, so the uh, this refers to whether or not there is a sound produced, the sound is produced with a major obstruction in the vocal tract. If it is, it's, pl it's plus consonantal. And if it's not, it's minus consonantal. And so sounds with the obstruction in the glottis, and, and, and the glottis which is in, in the vocal tract, but not in the oral cavity. So I should really change that to oral cavity. Um, so if, there, if it's just an obstruction at the glottis, they are not consonantal. So H and glottal stop are actually minus consonantal, which is perhaps why I didn't refer to H as a consonant on the previous slide. But it's still a fricative that's just not consonantal. Um, next, we have plus or minus syllabic. So this refers to whether or not the sound is acting as a syllable nucleus. And if it isn't, um, it's minus syllabic. And if it is, it's plus syllabic. So vowels are going, always going to be nuclei, so they are always going to be plus syllabic. And then the liquids are only plus syllabic when they are serving as the nucleus of their syllable. So only those syllabic liquids and nasals are plus syllabic. If they aren't, if they're in their coda or onset position, then they are minus syllabic. Uh, the next major class feature is the sonorant feature. And so the sonorant son 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 refers to that sonority which we talked about previously. And so these are sounds produced with non-turbulent airflow in the, the, the vocal tract. So sounds produced with non-turbulent airflow are plus sonorant, and sounds produced uh, without uh, non-turbulent airflow or with uh, turbulent airflow are minus sonorant. So that basically obstruents are going to be non -tur or turbulent airflow, so they are minus sonorant. So vowels, glides, liquids, and nasals are all your sonorants. And the things left are the obstruents with zero sonorants, so they're minus, uh, they lack the sonorant feature, minus sonorant. Um, the next set of features we'll talk about, um, we're doing this quite quickly, A, because we're out of time, but B, because we've already talked about all these things. This refers, as I said, to the phonetics. So the next thing we talked about in phonetics were the manners. Well, I think we actually talked about place first. But, well, we know that there's place and manner. And so, but, and we've talked about um, manner kind of here with these um, vowels, glides, liquids, and nasals. Those are all different manners, but they're all sonorants. And um, stop and obstruents are another type of manner. And so that's, that's the type of features we'll have in our, our manner, our set of manner features. And this refers to that manner of articulation. So the first manner feature we have is continuant. And so plus or minus continuant. Plus continuant are sounds produced with continuous airflow. So this would be the fricatives, because you could go for as, for as long as you want. Or your um, sonorant sounds are all continuous as well. So n or h, not h is a fricative. Or the liquids, l or r, and your glides, e, and of course, your vowels as well, because they're just ah. Uh... So those are all your con continu continuant sounds. Um, your minus continuant would be just stop. Another feature um, is uh, something new, um, but it helps us in distinguishing the stops and the fricatives from the combined stops and fricatives, which are the affricates. And so these affricates are indicated by a delayed release feature plus delayed release means there is an initial obstruction with a drawn out release. Everything else is minus delayed release. Um, so plus delayed release refers to uh, lets us get lets us refer to those um, affricates which have that initial obstruction with a drawn out release. So yeah, it distinguishes basically our stops, our affricates from the stops. Um, the next manner feature is plus or minus nasal, and this is produced with a lowered velum, which allows air to flow through the nasal cavity. So this gets you your nasal consonants, and it differentiates them from your non-nasal consonants. So the nasal consonants are plus nasal, everything else is minus nasal. Again, uh, we have a straightforward feature with lateral. 
And so plus lateral means the air is produced, uh, is a sound produced with air flowing around the sides of the tongue. And if it's produced over the top, then it's not lateral. And so that gets you the difference between L and R. L is plus lateral, R is minus lateral. Yeah, L sounds are lateral, liquids, uh, uh, lateral sounds are lateral, and non-lateral sounds are non-lateral. Um, so that's one type of manner feature, or that's, those are the manner features. The next uh, set of features are laryngeal features, and this refers to what's going on in the larynx. It refers to various activities in the larynx. Um, one we were familiar with is the voice. And so plus voice are the voiced sounds, and minus voice are voiceless sounds. So plus, sound, plus voice sounds are produced with a vibration of the vocal folds, whereas the voiceless minus voice sounds are produced without that vibration. Another laryngeal feature refers to how spread open the glottis is. So when you spread the glottis open, you uh, can refer to that with a plus spread glottis feature. And when the spreadus is not spread open, or, yeah, when the glottis is not spread open, then you have a minus spread glottis feature. Um, and an easy um, way to remember this is that all aspirates and H are plus spread glottis. I don't know why it's turning it into a curly brace. But um, your aspirate, that gets you the difference between um, plain, unaspirated uh, voiceless stops and aspirated voice, voiceless stops in English. Uh, another laryngeal feature is the constricted glottis feature. And so this uh, refers to sounds that are released with a closed glottis. Constricted, meaning closed. Um, in English, the only constricted glottis sound is the glottal stop. Um, so in lieu of having that um, we talked about in the previous slide, with the, these exceptions of H and glottal stop being minus consonantal, instead of the consonantal, which refers to a, an obstruction in the oral cavity, there's an obstruction at the larynx, um, which is indicated by a plus spread glottis feature for H and a plus constricted glottis feature for glottal stop. And so that leaves us with the place features. And so as we talked about on our first phonetics day, when we went up through the mouth with the, or the vocal tract with the place features, these are based on the, uh, ac yeah, the active and, yeah, the, the articulators in, yeah, the active articulators of the, uh, the sounds. So if we, instead of going up from the throat, we're going to start at the lips. So the first uh, place feature we'll talk about is labial. So labial sounds are produced with the lips. Uh, and a feature within the labial set is the plus minus round. And so if the lips are round, then you have a plus round feature. And if they're not round, they're kind of slack or tight, um, then you have a minus round feature. So round vowels and W are plus round, uh, whereas B and P are minus round. And M, B, the, yeah, basically the, the labial stops are labial, but minus round. Um, then you have the coronal features. And so these are sounds that are produced with the crown of the tongue, the, the kind of the top and front of the tongue. Uh, within coronal, we have a plus or minus anterior. So this refers to those where the, the tongue is moving to the front uh, of the mouth with the alveol palate or the teeth. And so interdentals uh, and alveolars are anterior plus anterior, whereas alveopalatal and palatal sounds, so everything from sh or ch uh, backwards, so that's ch, j, sh, and j, y, j, are um, minus anterior coronal sounds. So their target is in dark blue here, whereas the anterior sounds target is in orange. Uh, another coronal feature is plus or minus strident, and these are sounds that are produced with more noise than others. Um, so this refers to really your strident sounds, z, sh, and j, ch, and j. Those are all plus strident, whereas other fricative uh, and affricate sounds might be minus strident. So uh, th and z are definitely minus strident fricatives in addition to being plus anterior because they're made with the, t the tongue going forward 
to the teeth. Uh, moving again backwards, we have dorsal sounds. So dorsal sounds are produced with the dorsum, or the, the body, body and back of the tongue. Um, and so features within the dorsal set are plus or minus high. So here is actually where we get um, the, the vowel features. So um, high vowels are produced with, are plus high, but also velar sounds are plus high because the tongue is moving upwards to the the tongue body is moving upwards in a high place, and so that is plus high dorsal sound. Uh, on the other end, we have low sounds where the, with a lowered tongue, and so this uh, plus low vowels, plus low sounds are the low vowels and uvular sounds. There's no uvular sounds in English, but if there were, they would be plus low, in addition to having a dorsal feature. Um, you could also have a back feature, so plus or minus back. Back vowels are produced with the tongue going backwards, uh, so they get a plus back feature, and the tongue goes forwards for the vowels, or upwards, basically anything but back, um, they are minus back. So if it's not plus back, then it's minus back. Another dorsal feature, because all of the vowels are articulated with the dorsum, is the tense feature in English. So tense vowels are plus tense, obviously. They have extreme tongue placement. Whereas minus tense vowels are the lax vowels with lax, um, less extreme tongue placements, more centralized and, and mid, yeah, more centralized tongue placement. So all of your tense vowels are plus tense, and all of your lax vowels are minus tense. Um, another feature that the book uses is uh, the plus or minus reduced. And so this refers to those sounds that are made with an exceptionally brief production. And that basically refers to just the schwa. They were previously a different sound, but because of where they appear with the stress of a word, um, they are reduced. So plus reduced makes a vowel become schwa, basically. Anything else is minus reduced. So those are all of our features of English. Um, so what does that get us? So we talked about what sil syllabification gets us. What does uh, this breaking down of all of our segments and the features get us? Well. Features allow us to redefine these segments as meaningful descriptors that can act on their own, kind of separate from the segment. And so if we look to the book, um, this is from the previous edition, and it might be a different table number. I'll have to check up on that. Um, then we can see uh, the different um, feature matrix for all of the, the, the sounds in English. These are the consonants, including H and glottal stop, even though they're minus consonantal and the semi-vowels, which are also minus consonantal. Everything else here is plus consonantal. Um, and you, has, you see all of the features that we talked about just now are here. Um, uh, and as it says at the bottom here, low, tense, and reduced aren't used because they're not used for consonants. Um, we said there's no uvular sounds. There's no tense lax distinction of consonants in English. There's no low uvular sounds. There's no reduced consonants. Instead, we use those for the vowels. And so this is the vowel feature matrix for English. And again, um, uh, it has uh, a and a, a and a. Um, so it, it has a note here. Um, we use a, the second one, for the diphthongs, where if it's a monophthong, we use the, the this kind of script a, which is a bit more back, but uh, they use the same feature set. Uh, it just it just depends on whether or not it's a diphthong or monophthong in the transcription. But as you can see, all the features we just talked about are here. And so you should be able to look up any sound that we're talking about and refer to its features. And really, you could draw uh, kind of imaginary boxes around things that share features. So we see all the vowels are minus consonantal. And so if we want to capture the natural class of non-consonantal sounds, we would take all the minus consonantal sounds. So all of these vowels plus all of these in the consonant chart, quote unquote, that are minus consonantal. Again, all of the vowels are, are sonorant, plus many um, sounds over here are sonorant, and then all of your obstruents are minus sonorant. And so you could refer to your sonorants as the ones that are plus sonorant, or the non-sonorants, the obstruents, as minus sonorants. Syllabic sounds are here, as I said, all of your vowels are going to be syllabic. Uh, they always serve as a nucleus, but sometimes these um, 
the sonorant sounds can be uh, syllabic as well. Um, continuant, we talked about, again, we talked about all these features and they refer to actual types of articulation and different di distinctions we can make on the articulation and it allows us to um, give meaningful descriptors that can act on their own for these sounds. And so these allow for easy ac accounts of phonological processes and um, will allow us to define those processes when we start talking about derivations and rules next time. So that will be our focus on in the next lecture, our final week of phonology. So I'll leave you with the announcements again. Uh, happening this week, we have discussion posts due on D2L. Um, the second one, the instructions are there. So this has to do with relating phonetics to phonology and, ph and phonology outward to other parts of uh, inquiry in linguistics and elsewhere. And then on Friday, I'll be posting quiz two, which will cover um, what we talked about last week, what we talked about this, this week, and what we'll talk about next week. And so if you haven't read uh, the rest of the chapter or, or, or viewed next week's lecture, don't start quiz two. Wait until you've done that, because there are going to be questions that we, that, that we posted on Friday that we haven't really discussed until Tuesday of next week and Thursday of next week. So um, be warned about that. Um, if you do all the readings and view all the lectures, then you should do well on the quiz. Um, the readings for next week are to finish, I think, to finish uh, chapter three uh, with section four of contemporary, chapter three in contemporary linguistic analysis. So that does it for today's lecture. Um, I'll see you all next time. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.